I'm Director for Child and Adolescent Services at the <coughs> campus, and I'm just thrilled to be here to introduce the second part of our lecture series, um, being done today by Amanda Gatto, and um, working with trans and gender non-conforming young people. And I'm particularly happy that she's doing it. She's our, our chief social worker here at UVHC and the clinical supervisor for inpatient services. She started here when she was a long time ago in Trent. <laughs> <laughs> Amanda knows a lot about a lot of things and a little about a lot of things. She's um, a wonderful resource. Um, not only does she work here full time, but in her spare time, she um, works at the Institute for Personal Growth in Highland Park, being um, patients of private practice, and she's also an adjunct at um, the Rutgers School of Social Work. So um, this is our first of a two-part series. There is clearly a need for us all to get more information on this very relevant topic in working with children and families and adolescents. So uh, we'll kick it off today, and um, we'll see Amanda again next week. Welcome. Hello. Good morning. Thank you so much for coming. It's, I've been thinking about this for such a long time, beyond even when we started planning it, even before that. Um, as Diana mentioned, I've been working here at UBHC forever, and um, I stopped saying now. I don't want to say now how long because I, now it's making me, it's aging me to start saying how many years I've been working here. Um, but also outside of here, for about the last 13 years, I've been working um, at the Institute for Personal Growth in Highland Park and now in private practice, working with the LGBT community and specifically with transgender and gender non-conforming people, um, which is something that some people know about me and others are surprised to know. Um, and that's exciting too because I'm able to bring that information here to UVHC and there are a lot of folks now who are working with um, you know, with gender non-conforming people, especially young people. And so it's a great opportunity for me to bring this knowledge here, which is sort of a novel um, experience, and also for folks here to really, um, you know, to, to gain some information about this population. So I'm very excited to be able to do this. Thank you all for taking time out of your busy lives and schedules and, you know, client lives, uh, you know, uh, the things that you normally do to, to be able to come here and do this. Um, so this is a two-part conversation we're going to have today. Um, I feel like there's not enough, I feel like I wish we had more time together already and we just started, I've only been talking for two minutes, so I don't know what that's going to mean for you, but um, a, a couple of the things I know we want to talk about is uh, the fact of, you know, learning about using correct terminology, understanding a little bit about the development of transgender identity, and considering risk, risk and protective factors, also considerations for providing affirmative interventions, which is really the perspective that I'm coming from today and that I really hope that we can all come from. Um, also understanding social, medical, and legal options for transition, um, and then ways to contribute to a world that's safe and affirming for uh, transgender people. And we're gonna do this all in three hours, so one and a half hours today, and then one and a half hours uh, next month, so buckle up. <laughs> <laughs> so just to get started, um, I said a little bit, I think, about why I'm here. Um, this is work that I'm, I'm very passionate about. Um, one of the other things that I did as part of my work at, uh, at the Institute for Personal Growth was that I um, co-facilitated um, a therapy support group for trans and gender non-conforming kids, teenagers, and their parents. And uh, those groups are still going on, actually. I passed the baton because I'm not working Saturdays anymore, but... Um, they have those groups on the third Saturday of every month. They're still <coughs> ongoing. And in fact, this PowerPoint will become available to you as a resource. And that information is also <coughs> contained in this PowerPoint. Um, you can make referrals for kids and families. Um, and I highly recommend it because um, I think for teenagers especially, I think everybody in the room knows you really need to work with families in order to work effectively with kids. And this is especially true with this community. Um, and there's nothing like having a group of people who are experiencing something similar to what you're experiencing, especially if it's something that's less common. Um, and so kids definitely gain a lot from being around other kids who are going through similar challenges, and certainly parents do as well. Um, parents often say, you know, they couldn't have imagined that there would be a room full of parents who are experiencing, you know, similar uh, things with their own children. So, um, so that's why I'm here. And... And I guess I want to know, just from some folks in the room, what brings you here? What kind of things do you want to know after you leave these two conversations over the next two months? Or 
the next three hours. <laughs> the next two opportunities. So does anybody I want to be able to create a, an inclusive environment? Okay. I think that that's important. In your office, in your in school, the, in your in setting? the office, in the school, I think just sort of, you know, kind of everywhere. Okay, great. Anything else? Thanks, Ben. Resources. Resources in the community that yeah. you could refer yes. people to? Okay. Kathleen? Social or, you know, or support groups. Support and group. um, we've just noticed, um, just in, even in the family dynamic, that um, we have many kids that you know are having identity issues have come have come out to their families and sometimes we've helped facilitate that but also um, that are actually um, families that can afford and the youth that's in transition and that's something most of us haven't um, really worked with as much Okay, so in terms of increasing familiarity with sort of that process and yes. how to work with families in that process. Because it is a risk factor in many of the families that mm -hmm. we're working with. And they're under and the family's understanding of what is happening with the youth as well. Right, absolutely. Okay, very good. Anything else? Any other hopes or wishes? Educating the educators that we work with and how to make the school environment a safe place for them. Oh great. Okay, and actually, just to to that note, there are some resources also in this um, in this material about um, uh, educating schools and providing mod some model policies for schools to use uh, related to transgender students. So that might be of interest to you as well. Great. Anything else? We got families, resources, inclusive environments. I think we covered all the a lot of important things. Um, if anything else comes up, don't be afraid to share. Um, and if you have other questions, please um, feel free to ask those as well. Um, and it sounds like for most people, you know, these are some of the questions, um, you know, that we're working with. You know, why should we talk about this? How do we manage our own kind of uncertainty and confusion? You know, Kathleen mentioned, I think, a little bit about what maybe practitioners are experiencing. You know, when you see a child experience maybe a medical transition, you know, you might have your own worries or concerns about that process as well. Um, how to get more information. Um, and how to, you know, write the affirmative, sort of to Ben's point, um, to students in settings where, right, there are members of marginalized groups. Um, a lot of times when we talk about um, transgender experiences, um, the question comes up, is this a new thing? Because as you notice, right, this is an issue that's getting a lot more attention. Um, and I think, you know, it's important to know that historically there have always been people who live outside of uh, traditional gender roles. Um, and whether or not we view a person as transgender or even label a person as transgender really depends on the cultural lens that we're viewing a person with and how a people identify themselves. And part of that is influenced by right, our cultural milieu. Um, <clears throat> and so I think on some level, increased visibility and freedom of other groups have created an opening for people to express themselves more freely um, and perhaps there are other influences, hormonal or genetic influences, that have impacted the incidence, but more likely it's a, um, there's sort of an opening, right, in our culture that's created a scenario where people on the fringe, people who are marginalized, are able to, to move forward with increased acceptance. So this is one of um, my new favorite uh, diagrams. I used to use this as a diagram. <coughs> Um, which you can see why this is much more flavorful and especially with kids much more interesting um, This is the gender bred person And this actually you could use this is available online um, or I can make it available to you um, A nice little diagram that will help sort of outline you can use this with families also um, or kids in your programs uh, <clears throat> to really differentiate between some um, basic issues of terminology that we'll discuss today, that we'll use today. So you can see that the gender-bred person, um, <clears throat> the sense of identity, gender identity, really comes from a person's self-concept, right? Which we say in this person comes sort of from the brain, right? That's how you think about yourself. Um, and you might say it's sort of the chemistry that composes a person, but for the most part, it's how a person sort of interprets, right, their sense of identity. Um, gender expression has more to do with how you demonstrate, right, ex on, in the exterior, um, your gender based on your, um, 
the way you act, the way you dress, the way you behave, right? The way you, I like to say, I like to say the way you comport yourself. <coughs> Um, and you can see the expression there is sort of uh, uh, designated by the, the entire person, right? The exterior of the person. Um, biological sex, which we'll say a little bit more about in a minute, refers to things that we've normally described as birth sex or uh, what we're now describing as sex assigned at birth. Um, so those are the, the sort of biological aspects that we've thought of in the past or really that we've thought of. All, you know, um, as, as comprising uh, biological sex. Um, and then we're talking about sexual orientation, which has to do not with necessarily your sense of gender, but more along the lines of your attraction, right? Um, so who you're physically, spiritually, romantically attracted to, um, which may or may not be related to sex and gender. And actually, this um, particular version of this um, gender-bred person shows a lot of these um, aspects along the lines of a continuum, um, right, from male to female, from heterosexual to homosexual. And in some ways, you know, there is some discussion in the community about whether or not everything is a binary, right? So either male or female and everything in between, that maybe there's, there's actually some more flexibility and it's not just either or. However, for the purposes of sort of discussion, this diagram is going to demonstrate it that way. Um, <clears throat> so again, this can be sort of a useful way of describing the difference between sort of sex and gender identity, the way I think about myself, my gender expression, what I show the world, and my sexual orientation, which is who I'm attracted to. Um, and that those things can become kind of mixed up in some ways when we talk about transgender identity. And so it's important, I think, to be clear about what those, what those things really mean. Um, and so just to be clear again, um, I'm not necessarily going to go through all these aspects of terminology, but just, you know, so we're all on the same page. Gender identity is really a person's understanding of themselves as male or female or both or neither, because there's also flexibility in that area. Um, transgender refers to a person whose biological sex doesn't correspond, right, with their concept of their gender identity. <coughs> And also is an umbrella term, right, for people who experience gender in a flexible or fluid way. Um, transsexual is a term that's not as commonly used these days, but generally refers to somebody who's, right, com uh, who has, through surgery or medical treatment, has already done something, right, to improve the alignment between their physical sex and gender identity. But is a term that's not as often used. Um, and then intersex refers to people who have a variety of uh, medical conditions um, where their uh, reproductive or sexual anatomy doesn't necessarily fit typical definitions of male or female. And the reason that that's part of this is because a lot of people ask, you know, about the, the, um, about the um, comorbidity of transgender identity and intersex conditions, and there is some overlap, but the majority of people who are transgender are not people who have intersex conditions. So just to put that out there, although there are some folks who do have those experiences <coughs> as well. Um, gender nonconformity, you know, we've sort of talked about the use of the word nonconformity and, you know, thrown that around a little bit about whether or not that's an appropriate term to use. Um, does it sort of come across like noncompliant or non-adherent or, um, and, you know, it's a good question to ask. I think, you know, I'll, we might be moving towards the use of terminology more like fluidity, um, but it's pretty common language in the community for now describing people whose gender identity or expression uh, um, differs from cultural norms that would be ascribed to that person based on their sex assigned at birth, right? Um, cisgender is a, a fairly new term, I think, that's being used to describe people whose experience of their own gender agrees with the sex they were assigned at birth. So those would be all, you know, anybody who doesn't consider themselves transgender would be cisgender. Um, and most of the transgender kids you'll see will know this term. Um, and in fact, when I was running the um, group for teenagers, it was a very interesting experience that I had because I was actually the only cisgender person in the room. All the kids were trans or gender nonconforming. My um, co-facilitator was a trans woman, and I was the only cisgender woman in the room which is something that didn't, of course, really occur to me, because as the kids in the room would say, well, because of that, that's, I have cis privilege, I don't have to go around thinking about my gender. 
Um, but it was always an interesting interface with them when they would be talking about their experiences and you know I was the representative there of the person. Um, so anyway, that's a term that's, like I said, being used more often. Uh, sex assigned at birth, really, uh, and I think there's a differentiation between um, you know, what we were saying, birth sex, which I think has always sort of been considered a given versus sex assigned at birth, which really, you know, now in, in, in this perspective, we're sort of looking at as um, something that is maybe not as immutable as, as it has been considered before. Um, and then we have to always throw in a few acronyms just because uh, F to M, we're talking about a person who's transgender, uh, female to male, right, who might also be known as a trans man. Or um, M to F, a person who's transgender, male to female who might be known as a trans woman. And then this acronym is sometimes used with kids especially. It's TGNC, trans and gender non-conforming. All of that being said, of course, generally, if you want to know how a person uh, defines themselves, it's always best to ask the person. It's easiest not to make assumptions. Uh, one thing that can sometimes happen is that, you know, an assumption is made about a person's gender identity based on their appearance. And that actually can be kind of limiting in some ways because we don't really know about the wide variety of options, right, that people could use to describe themselves. Um, just a couple of other uh, words, just to make sure we're all on the same page. So transition generally describes the process of moving from identification with one gender to another, often starts off as sort of an internal process and then expands out um, to other people, family, right, loved ones, to school, those types of things. Um, <clears throat> Passing is a term that's used to describe the experience of um, being seen as the gender that's being presented rather than being seen as one's birth sex, right? So if I'm a transgender woman and I feel like I, I pass, right, then, then as I'm in public, I'm being seen as a woman. I'm not being seen as a man. I'm not being seen as a trans person, right? I'm, I'm, I'm passing. Um, and that's actually a very sensitive topic for most people. And so it would be something that you would not want to comment on, particularly when you're working with people. You know, it's, it wouldn't be appropriate to comment. You know, it would be a, just like you wouldn't comment on somebody's weight or some other personal characteristics about someone's body or their hairstyle or, wow, your nose is looking kind of funny today. Or, <laughs> right? You wouldn't comment on whether, you know, your own opinion about whether or not a person passed unless they particularly asked you or the setting was such that that was an appropriate, right, an appropriate type of comment to make. Um, you know, it can seem very invasive. Um, um, stealth is also sometimes a word that's used, especially with kids, which has to do with keeping the transgender, uh, one's transgender status private from other people. Um, which I think, you know, in some ways, um, some young people and some people in general, they feel very comfortable, right, moving about in the world. And others, I think, feel um, it's, it can be very stressful. So that really sort of depends on the person, their own comfort. Um, then there's a group of folks, right, who describe themselves as gender queer. So those are people who don't necessarily identify with um, conventional categories of gender, and there might be a, a piece of sexuality mixed in with that as well. Um, and then coming out, which is probably familiar to most people, um, right, describes the process of, of sharing a person's um, identity, in this case transgender, but also homosexual identity is, um, you know, perhaps there are people who have heard of coming out before. Um, and shares that information with significant other people. Um, so, <clears throat> moving right along. So, um, maybe not so long ago, you were born, and it was decided um, it's a girl, or it's a boy. And I wonder, um, how many people have either had children or um, experienced the birth of a child in your family? Probably every one of us, right? <laughs> it's an interesting thing, isn't it? Um, what do you think, how, how do you remember, or how do you know that children are, I mean, how, how is it determined it's a girl? What happens? You go to the doctor and they look at the sex over here. <laughs> they just sort of, oh, God. <laughs> it's a visual, usually. <laughs> it's usually a visual. And then what happens? What's that? When they put them in a pinker blue hat. <laughs> right. Then they put them in a pinker blue hat. And then it kind of goes from there, right? And I know people, and you probably do too, and maybe some of you in the room <coughs> tried this valiantly, 
Um, my sister-in-law, when she first had my nephew, we they were they wanted to do a gender neutral. Uh, they wanted to have it, you know, they wanted to do a gender neutral. I, I wish I had pictures of this child's toys now, my nephew's toys, um, because now he's eight and he's got probably three crates full of Nerf guns. I mean, there must be eighty Nerf guns in there. But so they wanted to to do the gender neutral thing with him, and it, and it wasn't very long before he started gravitating towards you know cars and trucks and Nerf guns. Um, and so the, I think the, um, the indoctrination in a way, or sort of our cultural movement towards, you know, sort of moves us all towards the path of our assigned, uh, uh, sex at birth is very strong. It's a very strong wave. Um, and I think also, even if we might try to balance those things out by creating a situation for children where there's more flexibility or more fluidity, it can be very hard to do that. And that it isn't very long before kids get into school or they're around other kids and those lines become very clearly divided. Um, and that a lot of what's happening is those decisions are made and those processes are in place before anybody really has anything to say, before any of us really have anything to say about them. And for many folks, that's not a problem because those things fit for us very well. And for many folks it is because they don't, right? And that's sort of what we're talking about now that for many people, you know, it's a girl, it's a boy, and the path that then is sort of, you know, laid out for you does not necessarily fit for trans folks. Um, and that kind of brings us to this other idea about gender being really a socially constructed concept, right? So when we separate the concept of gender from biological sex, we're really talking about um, <clears throat> these gender roles that we create as a culture that are prescribed or imposed in various ways, subtly and also actively, right? Sometimes more, more, uh, more, um, more actively, and um, there's expectations that are laid out for what's appropriate behavior for a person based on that sex, and that is really that learning happens through social interaction, right? Or social learning throughout life, and where do we learn sort of what boys are supposed to do and what girls are supposed to do and what happens when people live outside of those lines. It's really a social a learning experience. Um, and that really is what creates our own development, right, of our self-concept. And um, for folks who experience, right, something other than that binary, it can be a very difficult, um, you know, it can be a very difficult thing to navigate because Again, we're not necessarily expected to move outside of what's you know of, of those of those lines. Um, so, in this way of thinking, gender does not necessarily equal sex assigned at birth. Right? They're two separate things. So, just throw it out there. What are some of the expectations of people assigned either male or female at birth? Right? What, what are some of the things you can do or some of the things you can't do? So, for let's say for women, what are some of the expectations? Um, um, for women, for people who are assigned female at birth, what can you do or not do? Oh gosh. <laughs> what are some of the things women do and some of the things women are expected to do or, or can do or versus men, what men can, can do? Actually, when you asked that question, it made me think of there was a, a commercial that came out with regard to, it was, it was, I can't remember what it was for because it had a good message, but, <laughs> so I lost whatever they were advertising and just went for the message. But it actually talked about, like, run like a girl, and they asked several girls, how do you run like a girl? And they had, like, track stars, and then they had, like, you know, girls that were really athletic and, and how they were running, and it had nothing to do with the term of you run like a girl. Mm -hmm. And it was really empowering just to see that whole idea. So when you ask that question, I kind of think, along that line, like there are statements that are made that are sometimes, you know. Right, that, that probably what they were showing when they were saying run like a girl, it was like women running, right? Like young women running. Yeah, but they Versus were like run like a girl, which yes. is almost like, I don't know, I, I don't know what is running like a girl. I guess you're not running, it's not a strong As way. Powerfully, who yeah, it's not I powerfully, I don't, I don't even running. know if that was a word. <laughs> 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 I don't know, right, but, but there was, there was, it was interesting because the girls were asked, and none of the girls who were engaged in demonstrating running like a girl, you know, saw a difference in, no, I'm running, I'm a girl, but I'm running. Right, like a person, I'm running like a person. <laughs> right. 
anything else? Any other thoughts? What, are, what sort of, you know, some of the things of what you should, what you're supposed to do or not do, or what you're allowed to do as a woman? You know, you're supposed to. Um Right, right. So I can play with makeup and lip gloss, and I can play with baby dolls, and right. And if I and I can climb trees too, but then I might be a tomboy because for some reason, right, that doesn't fit in. And I mean, you know, in, in a sense, stereotypically, right. I'm sure we're all flexible in some ways. We let our daughters climb trees, and we don't judge them. But, but in a way, right, sort of stereotypically, right, for girls who climb trees, we're like, oh, that's interesting. That girl may be a tomboy, mm -hmm. right. So we think something different about her because she's doing that. Versus, right, if she's home playing with lip gloss or dolls or everything that's pink. Or if you go to Toys R Us, right, if you've been to Toys R Us lately, it, it doesn't, it's not hard to figure out, you know, where the girls' toys are and where the boys' toys are. The girls' toys looks like, you know, really something out of a princess castle, right? And the boys' toys are really, it's a much different, much different experience, right? I mean, right, as a female, I can wear makeup. I can wear my hair long. I can wear skirts, right? I can wear a scarf. If I look around the room at some of the women who are here, right, you know, I can see you wearing jewelry, right? I can see you have a scarf on. Um, you know, if there are men in the room who are dressed the same, it would be a different situation, right? It would not be as easily accepted. Um, there are places you can go, right? As a woman, I can go into the women's room, and no one is going to think about it. Um, and how about for men? Right, you have to be strong, right? So you can't be too emotional. Maybe you have to wear a suit and a tie, right? And if I'm a woman and I'm wearing a tie, I can, I can wear a tie, but you might think, oh, but, but it's going to give, right, a little bit of, people are going to think about that a little bit, right? And where can I go? I can go to certain places, but there are certain places that I'm not going to be able to go, right? Um, and then the question is like, right, what happens when someone's outside of those lines? And I think for many of us, Right? I mean, in the field that we're in, I think we have ways of thinking about that. But it does catch us, right? We do kind of think, oh, there's a girl that's climbing a tree. Oh, there's a woman wearing a tie. Oh, that's interesting. That man looks like he might be wearing eyeliner. Right? So we do kind of notice it. Um, <clears throat> and I think depending on how we, how we even look at those things, right, it depends on our reaction. So for most of us, I think, in the room, as mental health professionals, right, we have an understanding perspective. But of course not everyone does. So that's one of the challenges I think that we're working against in some ways. Um, and that actually, why we're sort of talking about uh, um, on a mild end, right, how some people might respond if people step outside the lines. But then, you know, there's another level, I think for transgender people that really, when someone really begins to transgress what most folks in, right, in sort of popular well, most folks consider to be the boundaries, you know, then people have start having much stronger reactions, right? And it really, it really, I think, you know, I think gender, what I've said a lot, a lot of times to parents, you know, gender is sort of a fundamental aspect of identity, right? And that many people would never consider it's something that's, you know, that's changeable at all. Um, so the idea that a person could experience something different than the way we see them often can be really shocking. And to watch a person transition can also be really shocking. Um, and to even acclimate ourselves, right, to thinking about that person differently and maybe using different pronouns to describe them and using different names, right, can also be an adjustment <coughs> period um, and, and also can really be a dangerous time in some ways for that person. So, you know, when people step outside of those lines in some ways, um, you know, it can be a, a, um, it can be a, a safety issue. So I just want to encourage you to just consider, you know, the fit between, for you, and I don't want to make the assumption that everybody in the room is cisgender, um, or that everybody in the room is completely comfortable with their gender identity, or that everybody in the room has a particular uh, gender identity, but just to consider, right, the fit between your gender identity and the name that people use for you, right? So, um, <clears throat> you know, that that name fits. Um, the pronouns that people use to refer to you. Right, that those pronouns fit for you. And that if you're female, how odd it would be for you if someone continually referred to you as he. It just wouldn't feel like it fit you. Um, and that you, how you're identified by other people in public, right? So I've been starting, now I call, people call me ma'am now. 
which is so awful, but... <laughs> <laughs> but how odd it would be, right? As a female person, if someone came up to me at a restaurant, and, you know, I was sitting with a female friend, and they were said, you know, oh, hello, sir, can I take your order? You know, how that would feel, like, so odd. Um, and this is the experience of a lot of trans people, right? Just being misidentified all the time. Um, and that that impacts where you can go and what you can do and how right you feel and how people respond to you. Um, and that if you, if you feel like those things fit, it's a blessing. And if, and, and if for folks that, you know, who don't feel like that fits, you know, that there's a lot we can do really to help, really, to help kind of fill that gap. Um, I have videos to share, but I'm not going to try to show them right this moment because um, technologically I'm not sure we're going to be able to survive it. <laughs> um, I just also want to bring in a couple of other aspects, right, because we're talking about um, identity. And there's just a, another point to bring out about intersecting identities in terms of not only thinking about transgender identity, but also, you know, race, ethnicity, and culture, um, the age of people, including youth, um, you know, adults, parents, class, religion, sexual orientation, that they're all different layers um, of identity that impact the people that we're working with, and also that's true for transgender people, and that uh, many of those layers also impact that experience as well, right? So we've certainly met people um, who have particular, um, you know, who uh, come from particular backgrounds where this is more accepted or less accepted, or religious backgrounds where this is more accepted or less accepted, um, and those are all things to consider, I think, as well when we're working with people, um, because, you know, we're looking at really gender in the context of other identities as well. Um, and that's something really to think about, especially when we're working with kids um, and their parents, especially. Because often we'll see kids, I mean, usually kids are, um, when kids come to treatment or they come to us, they're often way ahead of their parents in terms of their process of dealing with their identity. <coughs> Um, and they might even be culturally in a different place than their parents, and that can even be a, another compounding <coughs> issue, I think, for their families in terms of being in a place to be able to kind of understand where their child is coming from. Um, and it can just add, you know, sort of add a layer of time and sensitivity that's required um, to share that information. Um, just to talk a little bit about, so the other piece of this is that, um, you know, the DSM, I don't want to have a whole conversation about the DSM, but I do want to say that, you know, the DSM recently um, separated gender dysphoria into its own category and took it out of the category that listed it with other sexual dysfunctions, which is a good sign. Um, and actually that um, they replaced gender identity disorder with gender dysphoria um, and really added the distress as a requirement for the diagnosis because that really provides clarity that it's not transgender identities alone um, that are um, problematic, it's actually the distress that's related, the incongruence around the distress. And truly this is a situation I believe where um, it's, it's, it's the incongruence within the person, but it's really the incongruence that the person experienced in the face of a culture that's causing a problem, less so than what's right than what the person themselves is experiencing. You know, this is a situation where we're almost pathologizing people because of uh, a, a, because of the inter intersection between people and their culture. Um, <clears throat> but really, the the new DSM uh, influences that that issue of incongruence, um, and also there were some adaptations that were made related to the criteria for children in the previous DSM. There was a, um, a criteria piece that stated that um, children had to repeatedly state the desire to live as the other gender, but it, it really it was discovered that children might not verbalize that. They might just might, might see that more in their behavior, or they might demonstrate a strong desire but not actually verbalize it. So that was a, that was adjusted um, in the new criteria. I think you know the point of sharing a little bit about this the DSM criteria is really to demonstrate that. Um, we're looking at a period of time, even, so there's separate criteria for children and adolescents and adults. It's actually children is <coughs> one sub criteria, then adolescents and adults is another. Um, we're looking at a period of time, say for example, talking about children, it's a six month duration, right? So it's not something that just happened a couple of weeks ago or something that someone's been thinking about for the last couple of days. Um, and it's demonstrated by right, a strong desire um, <coughs> or an insistence. Um, 
to be of the other gender. Um, which might include dressing in clothing that uh, would be expected to, that you would expect to see in the other gender, um, or resistance to wearing right clothing typical, um, in, for example, in girls, uh, uh, resistance to wearing typically female clothing, strong preference for cross-gender play and playmates, um, including toys, um, and right. You can see also maybe there might be included a dislike of one's sexual anatomy and um, or a strong desire for characteristics of the experienced gender. And it also includes, right, significant impairment, right, distress in, in, uh, in social and, um, you know, school and other important areas of functioning. So that dysphoria, right, that's, it's really a sense of incongruence. Um, that's another video that would be so great to see, but we'll try it later. Um, the same is true really for adolescents and adults. Um, we're looking at also a six month duration. Similar, of course, we're talking a little bit different, right? We're not talking about play as much because we're talking about older people, um, but a strong desire to be rid of characteristics um, that are causing that incongruence um, or to, to develop the characteristics of the other gender. Um, <clears throat> a strong desire to be of the other gender or to be treated that way, and a strong conviction, right, that a person has the feelings or reactions typical of the other gender, and again, there's a significant distress uh, or impairment. <coughs> and I think it's useful also to know that there's a, um, that the course for children and adolescents is, uh, might be different. So you actually might see, and, and there's a, um, there's a TV show called I Am Jazz. It was a short show. It was a six-episode TV show about a young girl, a young trans girl, who was one of the first, I guess not one of the first, but sort of, I guess, one of the first people on TV to, <laughs> to, uh, to have a reality TV show, um, who was uh, a young trans girl who um, socially transitioned in kindergarten. And um, she did an interview where she spoke about her experience and her own feelings about her body at a very young age. Um, so children very young might experience a wish to be the other sex or a desire, um, uh, you know, unhappiness about physical sex characteristics, preferring toys associated with the other sex, and preferring to play with other, same se with other sex peers in a way that's much more marked than average children. So you might see, you know, other, um, you know, non-transgender kids who, right, who have some of these characteristics, but this is a much more intense um, experience, and um, that level of discomfort is pretty, um, can be intense, uh, not necessarily always, but often. And in some children, the feelings of gender dysphoria persist into adolescence, but not in everybody. So that's something we'll talk about in a minute. Um, in adolescence, right, so for some of those children, some of those feelings persist into adolescence, and, in, and for some, the feelings don't become evident until adolescence, right? So you might see some teenagers who don't really uh, speak about this too much until, you know, their, their early teen years, till puberty or so, um, uh, or to the beginning of puberty maybe, <clears throat> and that those feelings might intensify and those feelings of aversion towards their body might develop as they develop secondary sex characteristics, right? So, the, so as puberty continues on, those feelings of aversion might increase. Um, and that uh, in some ways we're looking at, uh, the research sort of looks at whether or not there's a, a likelihood of desistance or persistence, right? So is this gonna desist? In other words, is it gonna discontinue or is it gonna persist? Is it gonna continue? And some of the data suggests that um, when people are, or when young people are more intensely dysphoric, that increases the likelihood that it will persist. So that's something useful to know, especially in young people. Um, however, a lot of teenagers don't report a history of childhood gender nonconformity, and that actually can become a, 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 you know, that actually produces a surprise for parents often, who will say, like, I didn't know, I didn't realize this was happening, my child, you know, I, I didn't see any signs of this when my child was young. Um, and that's what, you know, just, a, just another course. Um, 
again, they may be very distressed and they might have a strong wish for medical transition and often they're way ahead of their parents in that way. So they're already down the road and their parents are, they haven't even left the building yet. <laughs> um, so, but that's teenagers. Um, so, you know, some of the consequences really ha have to do with isolation and, and, and that emotional distress. A lot of times kids might refuse to attend school or they have difficulties experiencing harassment or teasing, um, or they have difficulty because they feel pressure to dress in attire associated with their assigned sex, and that actually is something I've seen also in school. <coughs> kids have to wear uniforms because they don't have an option. Um, and sometimes those, uh, that preoccupation, that experience, interferes with daily activities and things like concentration, ability to pay attention in school. Um, and so it can become a preoccupying experience. Um, um, and also, as you would imagine, then it's going to impact relationships, right? Because depending on whether or not a child has been able to share that with people, uh, they might actually withdraw or feel more isolated or uh, more difficult, have more difficulty sharing with other people. Um, and then the other piece of this has to do with the, um, you know, the potential risk factors associated with atypical gender expression overall, right? Which include things like being highly stigmatized, um, experiencing discrimination and victimization, um, uh, school dropout, increased risk for mental health conditions, right? economic marginalization, which we'll talk about again um, as we go along, um, uh, including unemployment, and also you know, um, a, a loss of family support. Right, So those are some of the risk factors that I think as professionals, we want to try to mitigate, right? Um, not only that, but sometimes individuals' access to health services can be, can be impeded by some of the barriers and also by the discomfort that people might experience getting care. And then the experience that practitioners might have, right, in working with some clients uh, in this population. So there are also structural barriers that prevent people sometimes from getting adequate health or mental health services. Um, and I think, you know, we're lucky in this part of the country that there are a lot of providers, um, but that's not true everywhere. Um, overall, right, the prevalence, according to DSM, we're looking at a small number of people. However, I think th these, are, these estimates are low. Um, and part of that is because we're looking at people who have sought treatment in clinics, and there are lots of people who have not. Um, and there are some issues with some of the research related to, ge to gender identity and some of, some, of the, um, some of the sources of that information. So it's a little bit, uh, it's a little bit challenging to really capture. Um, there is, though, some information that there are, um, that uh, in children, right, we sort of more commonly see the, the ratio of boys to girls um, is higher. And then as we get old, as people get older, we tend to see more males. Um, although I can say in the groups that I've worked with, I've seen many more, um, the group that I worked with in Highland Park, we saw many, many more teens <coughs> who were um, female to male. Um, much, many more kids that were female to male in our group. And I mean, maybe that was just because of, it could have been a variety of reasons, right? Maybe those are the people who would self-select, who would come to a group, um, you know, Maybe it's the area, who knows. Um, so in terms of the, people say a lot, of, a lot of the questions that people ask are, how does this happen? Um, I think, you know, science is developing answers to those questions. Um, and there's some information about possible theoretical causal mechanisms, many of which are biological and genetic. Um, so some studies have found things related to, um, and I mean, I have all these references if you want to really get into it, um, but a lot of studies have found that there are some, some issues that, for example, some individuals who are um, male to female have um, been found to have androgen receptors that bind <coughs> testosterone less effectively, so there might be some issues there. Um, some studies have found issues around uh, um, genotypes that, um, uh, in which female to male subjects had distribution of alleles that were equivalent to male control, so there were some genetic pieces there. Uh, in some ways they found that 
there were some structures, some brain structures, uh, or volume of certain brain areas that um, uh, male to female transsexuals measured within the female range, and vice versa, right? Female to male transsexuals measured within the male range, so there was some brain um, similarities, right, between the genders that people were transitioning to and the biological sex of those individuals. Um, there was a, an increased prevalence of transsexualism found among identical twins, so that gives us a sense of a genetic components. Um, and also there's, a, um, there's some issues around ideas about prenatal hormonal factors that might have some influence. So there are some, there is some research out there that's being done about potentially uh, biological and genetic mechanisms. So I think it's important to think about that because you know, in many ways we thought like, oh, it's the way a person feels inside their, inside their, you know, it's the way a person feels about themselves. And that's true to some degree, but it's a little bit more than that. Um, it's a lot more than that, I think. It's really a fundamental sense of a person's identity, right? That's really immutable in such a way that you really feel like, it's more than just like, I feel like a boy today, right? It's like fundamentally, right? Um, that's my sense of who I am. And it's, you get a sense it's coming from a really innate place. Um, and then, of course, as we said before, there are some intersex conditions. And again, while um, most folks don't have these conditions, it's still worth mentioning because some individuals with those conditions will go through a gender change. So, in the end, the prognosis of the three sort of most common outcomes is that you know they'll, they'll, there's either a persistence or a desistence. So it either continues or it doesn't. Um, and it, if it persists, often most commonly it persists with a co-occurring uh, homosexual or bisexual orientation or desists right with a co-occurring homosexual or heterosexual orientation and that adults and adolescents have a higher rate of persistence than children and then actually some research has shown that a, a lot of times in children um, you know, depending on the level of distress and dysphoria and those factors, often children don't end up persisting. Um, often children end up um, ending up, actually a lot of times children end up in the second category, right? They desist with a, a homosexual orientation. Um, and again, with children, there's, medically there's nothing really we're going to be doing anyway, so right, the risks of intervention are pretty low. Um, <clears throat> so there's a little bit more information there we can see. Um, and actually, this I always just find very interesting. For both, uh, right, male and, for, so for both children, let's say natal male and female, right, so children who are assigned male and female at birth, who show persistence, almost all are sexually attracted to individuals of their birth sex. So a lot, so really what that comes down to is um, often, young people who are transitioning will come out as gay or lesbian first, um, and then as they transition, will retain that attraction, right, but their identity changes, right? So that's something that I just always found very interesting. Um, and so we're looking at a couple of traje trajectories, right? There's the early onset, so that's the childhood um, uh, onset. Um, so it starts in childhood and may or may not continue into adolescence or adulthood. Um, and, and there may or may not be a period where there's a desistence, um, but that often um, this is a group where um, and there's a little bit of a description, right, of, of uh, the attractions and how people kind of work, how, you know, how that sort of ends up unfolding for a lot of people. Um, but um, among, usually among adult natal males with gender dysphoria, the early onset group often seeks out care for hormone therapy and uh, uh, sex reassignment surgery at an earlier age, right? Because those are folks that have been experiencing for the, uh, this for a while. And the previous two bullet points just reinforce what I just said, um, that people with early onset gender dysphoria are almost often attract, always attracted to them, are often attracted to individuals um, that represent their own birth sex for whatever reason. Um, and this is something that you might already be experiencing if you're working with some young kids, but some clinically referred children with gender dysphoria often have uh, behavioral, emotional behavioral difficulties, um, maybe anxiety, often anxiety or disruptive 
uh, impulse control issues or depression. Um, as age increases, so may the behavioral or emotional challenges, which might be compounded by uh, non-acceptance of gender variant behaviors, um, and that might be especially evident with family, um, depending on how much um, conflict there is between the family and the child in terms of what's acceptable. Um, and actually, sometimes in older children, that behavior leads to increased sort of peer rejection and that can um, exacerbate those behavioral problems. And for whatever reason, um, autistic spectrum disorder is more prevalent in clinically referred children uh, with gender dysphoria than in the general population. And that is true with adolescents as well. So, so I'll have to research that. Um, and that's something I definitely noticed, uh, that we noticed in our group too. We had a fair number of kids in our group, more than you would expect, who were on the autistic spectrum, you know, who had, um, you know, what we would have called Asperger's, interestingly enough. Um, so then the, the second trajectory is a late onset gender dysphoria, which occurs usually around puberty or even much later in life, so some people really don't end up, right, um, really kind of experiencing this revelation until, or really sort of, I guess they're coming to terms with it until later in life, um, which those folks might say they've had this desire since early on in life, but they never really could verbalize it to other people. Um, but not everybody does. Um, many of those folks are adult males with late onset gender dysphoria. So, you know, if you watch TV or read anything lately, <laughs> um, you might have heard of Caitlyn Jenner, um, who represents this. Uh, type of group, right, so folks who um, were married to natal females, who after gender <coughs> transition may self-identify as lesbian. Um, <clears throat> so there's a little bit more information about that. And um, this is a group of folks that might have had more fluctuations in the degree of dysphoria, uh, who might have more ambivalence, or who might have had a period where they identified as gay or lesbian, um, Right as a as a result of the process unfolding, um, and you know, interestingly enough, you only really identify as gay or lesbian based on your gender in the face of the gender of people that you're attracted to. Um, so it's a slippery slope, really, in some ways. Um, again, clinically referred adolescents tend to experience anxiety. We certainly have seen that, uh, and depression, and oppositional defiance disorder. Um, again, autism spectrum is more, um, it's more common, and really it's that the anxiety and I think depression is what we see most often. And that anxiety I think can, you know, can even rise to the level of panic um, when kids are in school and they're in close quarters with other students, or they have to be in um, gender segregated areas like the locker room. Um, and there's a lot of gender segregation in public schools. I, you guys probably, school-based people probably know that better than I do. It's been a long time since I've been in a public school. Um, but I mean, there's a lot of that, right? So, and, and I think these kids experience a lot of distress around that because they're constantly feeling like they have to be in a group that doesn't quite fit. Um, and so that can cause other types of behavioral issues. So, how are you guys doing? You all right? How are we doing? Do you have any questions? Yes? You talked about, um, individuals uh, with, with gender identity disorder and there was a, a high comorbidity of anxiety and depression. That seems to make sense. But what would be the thought of the oppositional? Well, I mean, I think it depends. I mean, I think it sort of depends, uh, you know, on how you would think oppositional defined disorder comes along normally. But I think also one of the things that happens, you know, I, I think it's, um, I think it might be a response to uh, a feeling of not being heard or recognized or right and that maybe in certain family dynamics that type of reaction to those feelings might be to resist to defy right to become oppositional out of anger and frustration you know I was working with a, just a teenager the other day um, and we had uh, this is a kid who's recently coming out as trans and her mother is you know, a single parent, and like many parents, is sort of like, what? <laughs> what are you talking about? 
And the child had already, and this is a very common scenario too, the child had already chosen a new name and was already using it on Instagram and uh, with friends at school. And the mom, who had actually, a, a, as many as parents in the room might experience, um, had a, an investment herself in the name of her child, right? It meant something to her. She thought about it a lot and it, she chose it with the child's father who had passed away and it had significance. And so it was not a simple thing to just start calling, you know, her child another name. Um, and so we were talking about that in a session and it was sort of a new name anyway. And I was saying, you know, sometimes what I've seen is that one of the things that really can be useful is if families, you know, you could talk together. I said, you know, your mom is the one who named you in the first place. Maybe there's a conversation you could have together about, you know, if you're looking for a new name, maybe you could talk about that together. Um, and so they did, they were doing that, they were figuring that out. And then the next session, when they had picked a name, the child, the, the teenager was like, I don't know, not really feeling it, I guess, but wasn't saying that, was sort of like rolling on the floor and like playing around with some things and acting out in a way, like resisting the conversation, but not actually saying it. So I guess in a way, it gave me the feeling, I mean, I don't, I don't know that that child was oppositional, but there was an oppositional moment for sure. And you could see that with a different kid who had a different demeanor, that that could develop, right, into a way of relating, which is sort of feeling like, I don't feel like you're accepting me, you're not really listening, and so the only way I'm really gonna be able to assert who I feel like I am is by defying you. You know, and I think it comes out of frustration in that way. And they did actually eventually come, come to an agreement together. His parents, his parents did. It was, I was like, oh, why are you laying on the floor? <laughs> Yes. Um, do you have any information you might get to this about um, any correlation between um, youth that maybe haven't come out yet to family um, or friends and non-suicidal self-injury? Is that anything that you've seen, or um, is there any um, is there respect or respect? I don't know how. I, I don't particularly have any um, data on that off the top of my head. I mean, it's a tough thing to capture. It's a tough population to study in that sense. I mean, personally, clinically, I can say absolutely. I can say on the inpatient unit, we definitely have seen a good number of trans and gender nonconforming kids, and one of the reasons that drives them into the hospital is, you know, um, suicidality and self-harm. And often the kids that we see are in that, tra you know, in that period of just coming out and sort of sharing their identity with people. Um, so, I mean, it does make sense that that would be a risk factor, right, because of the sort of increased stress and also the, um, that incongruence between who I feel like I am and how the world is seeing me. So, I mean, I would have to look and see if there was specific research, but it is something that I've definitely seen in practice. Um, and that, you know, and that, um, and, and that there is increased risk of suicide, um, you know, of, of suicide and self-harm in the transgender community overall. So whether or not it would be related to pre-coming out or post-coming out, I would imagine, you know, right levels of distress would probably influence that too. I remember seeing some um, studies done through the Family Acceptance Project mm -hmm. in San Francisco related to that question. Um, and it was found that they, uh, they were able to see that family acceptance was directly related to um, protective factors that would decrease suicidal ideation, self-injury, things of that nature. So if you go to their website, they have all of their research listed there. Absolutely. I mean, there's absolutely no, I mean, I think all of us who work with kids, and I think on the inpatient unit we say, there's just like no replacement for loving family. There's just no mm -hmm. replacement for that. And I think for these kids in particular, um, family support um, is, a, is a protective factor, you know. Across the board. Yeah through adolescence and beyond. I mean, I don't think any of us got to a point where we became old enough and we decided we didn't need a family anymore, yeah. you know. Um, so just to touch base, so I just want to talk a little bit, we're going to move into a conversation about transition and support and intervention, then we'll continue this part of the conversation next time. Um, so there is a thing um, <coughs> that you can look up if you're interested. 
that was created by the World Professional Association for Transgender Health, and their website is wpath.org, and they created the standards of care. They're internationally accepted, and they're guidelines basically designed to promote the health and welfare of uh, people with gender identity disorders, and they really provide, um, it provides a lot of scientific information, a lot of, um, uh, really provides the guidelines for treatment, so for people who are looking at hormone therapy, for people who are looking at surgery, it provides information about the risks of those things, it provides information about the process that a person has to go through, um, because there is a process, right? It, it's not something that you can just walk in um, to your primary care physician and sign up for, um, right? There are letters that need to be written, and there's time that needs to be spent with various professionals, and this document uh, is quite lengthy, but it's provides a lot of good information um, and so um, I put that out there to you that is and actually provides a, a particular section about children and adolescents also so that's really useful um, <clears throat> so generally speaking when we're talking about transition uh, we're talking about you know a person's decision to live in a way that affirms their gender identity as they see it and that might include social, um, medical, and legal aspects. Um, the social aspects, really, were, there are a variety of different things. But for this discussion, we'll talk about coming out, um, using preferred names and pronouns, um, comporting, a person, comporting oneself in a way that aligns with gender identity and accommodations. And then we'll talk a little bit about uh, medical and legal aspects as we move on. Um, you know, coming out is a process usually that occurs internally first, right? So a person may have experienced, um, inf you know, they might be, I guess, be aware of this information about themselves for some time before revealing it to others. Um, and often, youth will select to tell their peers first and their parents later. Um, or their parents with the help of a therapist, depending on your setting and your situation. Uh, but often kids have told their peers first. Um, <clears throat> and that, you know, it usually moves out in rings, right? So your kids will talk, often share those, uh, those details with their immediate family, right, their nuclear family, and then it extends out as, um, you know, to extended family. And there's always considerations um, that need to be taken around safety and acceptance especially when we're talking about kids coming out to parents. Um, and coming out also might include right, sharing this identity at school or at work or in other places, depending on what kids are involved with. Um, and you might be involved, actually, if you're working in a school setting of helping schools to, um, to be prepared to receive this information, um, to create an environment that's affirming or that's supportive. Um, you might be involved in helping kids have conversations with their parents or providing information education to parents or strategizing with families about how to let this unfold with other family members. Um, a lot of kids have opted, that I've worked with, have opted to share this information with family members themselves. Um, others prefer their parents to do it. Some kids have sent letters to family members. I mean, so there are lots of different ways. I don't, I don't usually recommend the Facebook announcement. I know <laughs> that teenagers will be teenagers. They do what they like. Sometimes that's how families find out. You know, it's like, I noticed you changed your gender to male on Facebook. You know? <laughs> um, a lot of times also this comes with, right, uh, this is the, the social transition process includes beginning to use a preferred name and pronouns um, and asking people to do that. So, um, that includes, that might include people at school. I think usually with kids, their peers are most readily accepting, often. Um, but in school, they, kids might ask their school um, teachers or others to use the preferred name and pronouns. I think often schools will say things like, oh, we have to use their legal name. And I'm sure that that's true. On the other hand, I'm sure that they use nicknames of kids all the time. I'm sure there are a million Jacquelines who have been called Jackie and a million Roberts who have been called Rob, so I'm sure we can work that out. We can use your legal name and find a way to use your preferred name and pronouns in classes. 
um, and letting other people know those preferences. And also I think part of this has to do with those of us who are working with trans and gender nonconforming people, that it's an adjustment period, right, for us to get used to using a new name for people and new pronouns. And there's so many gendered words that we use that we don't even always realize are gendered, right? I was working with one of my kids uh, a couple weeks ago, and, I, and um, this is a child who, this is the kid, same kid who was rolling on the floor. And, I, um, and he's preferring now to use he, but when I met him, I met him as she, and I was, but I'm pretty good with that, so I'm using he, but I wanted to say, oh, you're, you would make a really good actor, but I accidentally said actress. And it was such a weird, I was so surprised because it was a word I hadn't even really been thinking in advance, had a gendered meaning. And then I realized I said it, I was like, <laughs> um, So using, um, using preferred names and pronouns and then being cautious and thoughtful about gendered words, right? Because those sneak in on us sometimes. Um, and then often there's a challenging period, right, during social transition where a person then begins um, to, like I'd like to say, comport themselves in a way that aligns with the gender identity. So that's going to include exterior changes, right? So a person might change their hair and uh, might do something with cosmetics. A person might change their clothing. Um, there's some voice coaching that can happen, right? So some um, options for that type of, you know, changing the way you speak. Um, looking at body language, right? The way we hold our um, to hold ourselves when we're conversing with people. Um, so those are sort of things that people then, as part of social transition, begin accommodating themselves to. Um, and again, like I said, that can be a challenging period because often, you know, social transition happens, it could happen long before medical transition. It could happen in the absence of medical transition. You know, people are not necessarily even going to pursue medical transition. So, um, you know, um, this could sometimes be as far as people end up going. And then also we have to deal with this issue of public accommodations, right? So those, um, uh, particularly those accommodations that are separated by gender. So restrooms and locker rooms and dressing rooms, those types of things. You know, typically people tend to, you know, the restroom issue tends to be a big issue often. It could, you know, derail an entire conversation, I think, sometimes about, um, uh, public accommodations for trans people. Um, you know, for the most part, I think people generally use the restrooms that, um, that are most comfortable to them and in which they can comfortably present themselves without feeling like they're, um, they're going to uh, create a public disturbance, right? Because a lot of times people feel, um, you know, even cisgender people who are outside some of gender lines will sometimes use public restrooms and have people look at them in a strange way, and it can be very uncomfortable. And sometimes it can be dangerous depending on where you are and what your situation is. So, you know, I think it's just helpful for everyone to be able to use restrooms freely. That's important. Um, but other, other places, right, like locker rooms and schools and dressing rooms and um, in clothing stores um, or other areas where people have to navigate because, you know, they're looking at trying to figure out, um, right, where, where they're going to be able to go, and sometimes it can be very difficult. So those are other things that kind of need to be considered, uh, that people really need to consider for themselves, too, during social transition. You know, on that note, I think it's important to consider as well, <laughs> there was a report that was done, actually it was um, a survey, and it was one of the first surveys of its kind, it's actually, it's actually being redone soon, which is pretty exciting. It was a National Transgender Discrimination Survey, so it was done just a little over five years ago now. It surveyed over 6,000 transgender and gender nonconforming people over 50 states. It was a joint effort of the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force and the National Center for Transgender Equality. Um, so it was the um, only study of its kind. And um, people completed both online and paper surveys and uh, some of the discoveries were that a large majority of the people lived in extreme poverty, so that transgender people were four times more likely um, to have household incomes at the poverty level. And, um, and as a result, or a, a, in connection, 41% um, reported attempting suicide compared to 1.6% of, of the general population, so a much higher increased 
a much more a much increased risk of suicide um, attempts, and those rates were even higher for people who had lost a job due to bias, who were harassed or bullied, um, who had a low household income, who were victims of assault. So, um, you know, these are the factors, right, that are contributing to uh, bless you, who are contributing to um, to to these are some of the risk factors, right, that, that people are experiencing um, that I think when we're talking about, you know, social transition, one of the things we're trying to figure out also is how to do that in a way so that people are less likely to experience bullying, harassment, and victimization, um, so people are more likely to have the support that they need to be able to be successful. You know, it used to be when transition was... Um, considered, and this was in a, previous, in, in a previous version of the standards of care, that a person had to demonstrate a year of living um, sort of in, in the preferred gender um, before other interventions would be considered. I mean, that can be a very difficult thing to accomplish. Um, but the idea, the rationale behind it was that um, <clears throat> there, want, there was a, a desire to really have demonstrated that people were going to be able to take care of themselves, right? People were going to be able to work, people were going to be able to have the resources that they needed um, as they transitioned, and so those are still things that we want to be thinking about today, I think. We really want to be able to think about whether or not a person's going to have the support that they need and what we can do to kind of make sure that that happens. Um, it's helpful, right, to help make sure the kids finish school, that they're going to be able to move on. Um, and I think more and more, I've personally been seeing that kids, you know, are, um, Kids are finishing high school, they're going on to college, and they're you know, happy and healthy and doing well. And hopefully we'll have um, a person that will come and speak next time uh, that we meet here um, who will be able to share some of that experience. So that impact of, um, you know, of, of discrimination um, you know, is something that people you know, will experience even more so as they begin to live openly. Um, not that they don't experience it outside of that as well. Um, but that's the stigma associated with gender nonconformity. And um, as a result, right, that increases people's vulnerability to developing certain mental health conditions. And, uh, and that can contribute to abuse and neglect uh, um, in peer and family relationships. Um, and, and in addition, that the discrimination that was discovered by that study was so pervasive and the anti-transgender bias so persistent that the combination of that and structural racism was so devastating that actually trans people of color fare worse than everyone else in all the measures that were that were studied in that in that survey. So, um, so that's another aspect that we really have to, to really pay attention to. Um, so this is a so this is a true story. Um, this is a cartoon. On the top part says, parents react to transgender issues, and one parent is saying, this book says it's okay, and another parent is saying, this book says it isn't. And then kids react, and there are two children sitting at lunchboxes, and one says, I'm a girl now, call me Jane. And the other kid says, okay, are you going to eat all of your Oreos, Jane? <laughs> um, and for the most part, and look, she's got a let it go lunchbox, so if you're good to Elsa, you're in good, you're in good stead. Um, so, and actually, I think, you know, just to bring a little levity, this is actually sort of a, I think, um, one of the things that's kind of true, that a lot of times, right, for parents, it's, um, you know, uh, it's a very difficult process to go through, you know, especially when you're thinking about medical intervention for your child, um, and I think even outside of that, right, parents want their children to be healthy and happy, and they don't want anything bad to happen to them, and a lot of parents are worried, um, and a lot of parents are worried about things that they don't necessarily realize that they don't, you know, they don't have to worry about, right? Their parents are worried that their child isn't going to find a relationship, or parents are worried that something is going to happen to their child, and, you know, I think some of those things we have to think about, and others really, we have to realize that there are plenty of people to love you, um, but I think a lot of times kids, and this is not to say every child has this reaction, but a lot of times kids are more open and accepting their, it's not, it's not as complicated for them in some ways. Um, so just to move on a little bit and talk about, well, I guess before we do that, is, do you have any questions or comments about social transition or are there any um, kids that you've worked with that you have questions about? I 
just have a question because I think schools really struggle with the bathroom issue. Mm -hmm. So often they feel like it's it's safer to just have them change and go in the nurse's office, but I sometimes wonder if that's really isolating. So I'm just curious as to what your thoughts are on that. You know, I mean, I think it's better than nothing. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I mean, ideally, it's a sort of a separate but not that equal kind of scenario, right? I mean, I think a lot of schools kind of use that as a compromise mm -hmm. because they struggle with alternatives. Um, I, I think that there are other schools, though, that are able to kind of navigate that in a way that's a little bit more natural to students. I mean, you know, in that sense, you know, you, you could make the argument, right, that that student is sort of unfairly being required to use a separate facility in an inconvenient location, you know, which might not be fair. Mm -hmm. And that might be the perspective I would take. Um, on the other hand, schools need to figure out, right, right how, to, how to balance mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. you know, and how much of a concern it really is. And that there are all these other ideas about, I think people feel a little bit like the bathroom issue is a Pandora's box. Mm -hmm. And that if we let transgender kids choose what bathroom they're going to use, well then, you know, what is going to happen? We're going to have all kinds of things happening, you know. Um, I mean, ideally, kids, the, ideally kids could use the bathroom that they're comfortable using, mm -hmm. and it's not an issue that everyone in school administration, right, needs to be considering. Um, and I think even this conversation about it, right, it's like the idea that that child, more so than any other child in the, stu in the student body, right. right, is having their bathroom experience examined, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. sort of brings it to another level. Yep. Right, where you're sort of thinking like, why are we thinking so much more about what this person is doing? Mm -hmm. It's really just, right, it's a right. very fundamental human need, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. that's not actually that complicated. I mean, a lot of schools have gender-neutral bathrooms. Mm -hmm. You know, that's an alternative. Uh, a lot of schools have gender-neutral bathrooms. It's just one, you know, just one bath, you know, one, uh, one toilet, mm -hmm. one stall, one. Um, you know, that's a, sometimes an alternative. I, I wonder what would happen if we weren't so, if we weren't gripping it so tightly. Mm -hmm. I wonder if it would be mayhem or if it would just be casually people using the restroom. You know, a little bit of both. naturally, yeah. And, yeah. Some people will use the bathroom. Some people will do other things. Right. On that person. Right. I mean, there. I mean, and you know, there are. I think there still is. You know, even in this sort of example, right? If we're talking about like a young, let's say, a young trans girl, right, using the women's room, that's sort of congruent in a way, right? Mm -hmm. You wouldn't expect, like, it wouldn't be appropriate for them, like the boys' football team, to go into the girls' locker room, mm -hmm. like that. There's that's that would be allowed. Right, so in some ways, the things that we fear happening would stand out actually in such a way that they would not be permitted, right? Um, so that's, I guess, the long story and the short story. Um, and there are some model policies, and I'll, I'll check and see if they're in this PowerPoint okay. that sort of describe that. I mean, I almost, you know, the bottom line for me is I think it, it borders on an invasion of privacy, <coughs> you know? And I, and I do respect that, um, it's important to keep people safe. It's important for people to feel comfortable, and you know, I think that's important. I think that's important to do. But also, you know, again, it's like, oh my gosh, this poor student—they're just trying to relieve themselves during the day. And then actually, it's a, you know, it's a health issue too for trans people in public, right? That you feel like you can't use a restroom because someone's going to be say, someone's going to say something to you, or right, going to make you uncomfortable, or going to scream at you, or. You know, I've been in public with actually female-bodied people, female-identified people who are gender non-conforming in the women's room, and people are like, do you know this is the women's room? We're like, well, should, do, you, like, do you want to see ID, or should we prove it somehow? Or, uh, most people don't, right? Most people use the right restroom. Mm -hmm. um, what else? That was a good one, though. That's a, always a hot-button issue, especially in schools. Yeah, you know, struggle. Yeah. I have a question kind of related to your the actor actress mm -hmm. for kids who use non-gender or gender neutral pronouns like z or they or something like that in having a conversation and being respectful um i guess my question is how not to to use the wrong actor actress if someone's using a gender neutral pronoun 
Well, that's a good question. I mean, you know, I think, I guess it depends on the person too, right? I mean, typically, right, we in our sort of culture, we've used the male, I don't know, specifier, for lack of a better word, when we're neutral, right? So if I want to speak about people who are acting, I'm talking about actors, right? I would use the male version. So you might be able to do that. Or you might just speak with the person and find out, because I think it's hard. You don't always know. Right, exactly. And it's hard to completely neutralize your language. And right. I mean, I've been practicing this for a long time, and I caught, I was like, oh, actress. <laughs> oh, how could I? And I fumbled from it. I was like, oh, sorry. I, I, oh, it is oh. very hard to have an entire conversation. And the kid was like, don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> they were almost like, he was like, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. It's fine. I was like, oh, but I just want to acknowledge that I just did that. And, you know, but so I think, you know, you can check with the person. Um, and I think also, you know, there's no way, to, I, I don't think you can neutralize actor, actress more than actor. You know, so you might just, right, try to use the, the I think, like I said, in our common language, we tend to use the masculine to, 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 to be more neutral. So that's probably the best bet. But you could always find out from the person too. And I mean, they is actually, right, sort of a common preference for people who are gender fluid, which also takes a little bit of adjusting to. But, but we can do it. Yeah, I mean, I think preferences vary. You know, some people are gender neutral, and some people are you know, comfortable with you know, new identity and want that pronoun to be specific to sexual uh, identity. So I think it's a matter of communication. I mean, I think you have to be able to have a give and take and a dialogue to say, you know, I'm learning about you, and you're going to help me understand. I think that's really important in the whole process. Mm -hmm. And I think also, if you come to the conversation, you know, with an attitude of openness and willingness and, you know, you're kind of honest about your, you know, your position. I don't know exactly how to do this with you, but I'm trying to learn, you know, right, I'm gonna, I'm a, I might make a mistake. Um, that people understand that you're trying versus the other situation, right, where, you know, I've told you many, many times I prefer to be called Manda and she and you still won't do it, you know, and then I might get frustrated, right, that's a different situation. So I think when, when we really are trying, right, that people tend to have more patience with us, especially if, right, we're open about that effort that we're making, right, versus we're just ignoring, you know, blatantly kind of ignoring the person's wishes. Um, what else? Anything else? Amanda, how to help the, the kids when they start to explore this issue? You know, not that they are, okay, I am a trans or something, but they start to wonder. Uh, how to help them clinically, you know, to be there for them. Uh, I mean, all the teenagers explore sexually, mm -hmm. you know, and I like it more than others in gender. Mm -hmm. But uh, I am thinking of this girl that, okay, I am a lesbian, and next uh, she has a girlfriend, a boyfriend, and after that, and, and then they start to say, but I don't like my body, and there are parts of my body that I don't like. And, you know, them, you know, how to help her to be supported but, and to allow her to explore all that, mm -hmm. you know? That would be my question. I think one of the things is that kids are, you know, we're, kids are very, they're like, they want to put a, they want to put a stamp on it sometimes. You know, it's like, I'm a lesbian. And it's like, oh, I like boys. Am I still a lesbian? Mm -hmm. I don't like, you know, I think to have the attitude Right, you're young. You're just figuring this out about that yourself. Is, it's, I mean, I not say. that we would say you're young because they would kill us probably. Yeah. But you know, yeah. it's like, you have your whole life ahead of you. Yeah. There are many opportunities to, yeah. to think about right who you are and what you want and who you love and understanding yourself. And there actually, there's a workbook. I can give you the information. There's a gender workbook that that um, that's kind of useful. Has a, some good questions. Right, so to sort of think about it, write about it, maybe read about it, talk about it, meet some other kids, right, who are, you know, there are a lot of support groups for LGBT kids, whether or not they're transgender, that you could go and talk with other kids and get a sense of who you are. You know, I wouldn't necessarily refer kids to Instagram, but that's kind of where they all go. I don't know, it's like hashtag whatever. Um, but I mean, to kind of give them, to have, sort of encourage them to be patient and, you know, just sort of give themselves some time to figure it out and that you don't have to know right away. And that actually you might always be a person who's unfolding, right? You might never get to a point where you decide this is exactly who I am forever and ever. 
you know, and that there's, it's okay, that's okay to kind of figure that out. But that there are lots of resources that they can draw on in terms of like, like I said, things to read, things to look at, you know, even websites that I could provide that they could look at, you know, to kind of get good information. And, and then, you know, yeah, and then talking about it, I think, too. Not, not just to, you know, not just to us, to parents, but also to other people, no, to other kids. She does her research and comes to right. the sessions and talks about this. Right, right, right. Mm -hmm. I think the main thing is sort of like, it's okay, right? It's okay whoever you are. Mm -hmm. And it's okay that that's sort of like, you know, kids make fun of me. It's like, it's okay that like you're, who you are is blooming like a flower, right? It's mm -hmm. like you're, it's unfolding and it takes some time to, to discover that, you know? And then it's okay to be patient and figure it out. And then it doesn't have to be something you know right away. And like I said, it doesn't have to be, you know, this is who I am and that's it forever. Because we always, we all get trapped in that, <laughs> you know. Um, but I think, you know, having those, uh, the ability to talk to other people can be helpful too. Because a lot of times kids are just kind of in their own head about it. You know, they have no, well, nowhere else to go. Or they, have so, or they feel very stigmatized and they feel like they can't talk to other people. And that's kind of an oppressive experience too. So to kind of get it out there a little and to realize, like, you can be a gay person and have a wonderful life, and you can be a trans person and have a wonderful life, you know, and it doesn't have to be, like, like something that you're holding on or that you can't share with other people, too. So, okay, I'll get, okay, those resources, too. So, I think perhaps that might be the end for today. Um, I don't know, Diana, are you, um, is there more, do you? No, I just thank you very much, Linda. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.